dark universe. How gravitational waves let us hear the sound of space. Carsten Dunzmann, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, Hanover. On November the 9th, 1989, I was in California preparing for my move back to Germany. I missed the announcement on that day and later could hardly believe it happened. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes history is written. We have written science history. We were on 671 cover pages of journals all over the world, weekly journals like this one, but also the most important science journal in Germany. <laughs> of course, the most important things are biggest on this title page, but we are there. On the right, you see him? I never thought gravitational waves would make it on the cover of the Bild Zeitung. When that happens, you know you've made it. <laughs> we were also on the cover of this magazine, Physical Review Letter is probably the most important science journal for us. And uh, what happened? We had detected gravitational waves. This was a big undertaking, a monumental effort and the paper had 1,004 authors, as you can easily count when you go through here. <laughs> and these 1,000 authors were from 133 institutions in the world. A gigantic effort that had gone on for half a century. But let us back off a little bit. We have all looked at the universe with our eyes for thousands of years. We've built better and better eyes. We call them telescopes. And we know that the universe looks different, whether we look in the visible, in the infrared, with radio waves, with x-rays, any type of electromagnetic wave, and we have a different universe. So we know what the universe looks like. But is that all? It's a little bit like you're walking through the jungle in here. You see the trees. You see the water. But isn't there something missing in terms of information? Something very important? Now it really feels like a jungle. You have to use an additional sense and now suddenly you know what the water sounds like. And sometimes you even get an unexpected thing that you didn't know was there. Haven't you all wondered once in a while if there's thunder? When a star explodes, like this one here, that's the supernova 1987A, seen seven years after the explosion with the eyes of the Hubble Space Telescope. Can we hear the universe? That would be really nice, because more than 99% of the universe is dark, as we know and will never be observable with any type of electromagnetic waves. But of course, you know, that's nonsense. That doesn't work. Sound needs air to propagate. There is no sound in vacuum. But Einstein helps. He has done many things in his life. Most people know him for E equals MC squared. But that's special relativity, which really is a theory of clocks and measuring yardsticks. No, he also thought about gravitation, and that is described by general relativity brought to us in 1915. And contrary to common expectation, general relativity is a very simple theory. It can be summarized in one sentence. Okay, it has two half sentences. <coughs> you have to be willing to accept that space can be curved. Then the rest is easy. Matter curves space. And then the curved space tells the rest of the matter how to move, and it moves along the shortest possible trajectory in a curved space-time. Example, the Earth makes a little indentation into space, and the moon rolls around in the shortest possible way, and if there would be no friction, it would never fall down on the Earth. But don't worry, it takes quite a long time. So in this description, gravitation has disappeared, and the gravitational force is really curvature of space. Light rays, for example, propagate in this curvature of space and straight ahead in a curved space-time sometimes looks rather crooked. An important example is this one here. Gravitational lensing 
in the Abel cluster. What you see here, all these dots are galaxies. Galaxies like our own one. And if you look very closely, then you see little arches there, stretches of light, little things. And that is light from a galaxy which is way, way beyond this. And the light from that galaxy has to go through the curved space-time, and it's completely torn apart while it is doing that. That's called gravitational lensing. Sometimes you don't even see the object that's causing this gravitational lensing. Something dark in the foreground is doing this here. That's an area where the gravitation becomes too strong. It is actually so strong that even the light cannot escape. Such objects are called black holes. Here we see one of the rare pictures of a black hole taken in original colors. <laughs> <clears throat> now, if these objects move, any objects, then they are carrying their space-time curvatures with them, and the information about that propagates slowly into the rest of space. <clears throat> and these distortions of space and time that move at the speed of light are called gravitational waves. To be a little more quantitative, gravitational waves are plane transverse quadrupolar waves. Now you know it. <laughs> Shown here. It's very simple. Space is stretched and squeezed horizontally, then vertically, horizontally, then vertically, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So it's very easy to detect gravitational waves, right? You only have to measure length changes. The only problem is this effect is rather small. Let's take a type 2 supernova core collapse somewhere in the local group, not too far away, better not too close. That distorts space here by one part in 10 to the 21. And everything within also, like the Earth, is stretched and squeezed in a quadrupolar fashion, here shown slightly exaggerated. <laughs> also, our apparatus is stretched and squeezed by one part in 10 to the 21. That means it's stretched and squeezed by one thousandth of a proton diameter. The proton is the little thing in the nucleus of an atom. <coughs> so that's an atometer, or to be more precise, it's really a few hundred zeptometers that our apparatus is stretched and squeezed, and unfortunately, it only lasts for a few milliseconds. That's the reason it took a hundred years after Einstein predicted this to finally find them. Michelson interferometers are the thing to measure this. Here is the first one, 1887, and they reached a fantastic accuracy already in those days. They were able to measure 600 picometers, but nowadays we are doing much better. We have added 10 zeros to this, behind the comma. There is now a network of laser interferometric gravitational wave detectors searching for these. The two LIGOs in the US, GEO 600 in Germany, Virgo in Italy, our Japanese colleagues are building underground in the Kagra, Kamiokande mountain uh, region, and there's LIGO India. And then it was September 2015 that would profoundly change the life of these two postdocs in our institute. A beautiful Monday morning, like always in Hanover, 11.50, they were staring at their computer screens. LIGO was still in commissioning, not really taking data. And then an alert came along. To be more precise, the coherent wave burst data analysis online pipeline sends an alert. That is a warning that the computer sends that something strange is in the data. So Marco looked, and he couldn't believe his eyes. It was too beautiful what he saw. So he called his colleague, Andy, look at this. And he said, ah, can't be. It's probably a test signal. They're always feeding in test signals. They could have told us. So. Hmm. There was no sign for a test signal. So they finally called the LIGO control room. There it was 2 and 5 in the morning. The night watch was there, and he said, what do you mean test signal? They're all sleeping. They've all gone home. Piece by piece, our whole institute was in this, uh, half the institute was in the office. Was this a test signal? No, it wasn't. Hectic activity freeze the detector, and this is what they saw. The signal of two black holes coalescing, and this is what it sounds like. You clearly hear the two black holes accelerating, accelerating, faster and faster, and whoop, they're gone. <laughs> I admit, this was a simulation. This is what the real signal... Whoa! This is what the real signal sounds like. So from this thing, wasn't that beautiful? <laughs> From this signal, you can learn a lot. 
You can also learn that three solar masses were burned in a tenth of a second. This was the most gigantic event that ever was detected by mankind. It happened 1.3 billion years ago. Not much happened here on Earth at that time. We were there in the history of Earth. There was, to be precise, the ectasium in the Mesoporterizoicum, which, by the way, was the most difficult part of preparing this talk, to pronounce this <laughs> word. There was not much going on. There was no continents, and the only life was little monocell algae. When that happened, two black holes 1.3 billion years ago were rotating around each other. Gravitational waves were, of course, also emitted. And here we see a real <coughs> computer simulation of the Einstein field equations. And you see the two black holes shown in black. And now, pay attention to what happens when they touch. Do you see the waveform there at the bottom? They're about to touch. And now, look at the waveform. So what happens there? A new black hole is created, but the new black hole is in an excited state, and it doesn't want to be in an excited state, and so it rings down and emits gravitational waves, and you know how that feels like? It doesn't want to be excited, so a black hole goes and shakes a little. If you want to feel how a, how a black hole feels like, then I've brought an example for you. Let's see if we can see this. You know what this is? Gotterspeise. Jello. And it has exactly the consistency of a black hole. <laughs> you see it shaking? <laughs> and now we do what you couldn't do in reality. We dive into a black hole, and this is what you would see. <laughs> and then came June, and I know it was the Soccer European Championships, but who won? Einstein. There was a second event, and again it was two more black holes. Now Einstein never believed that black holes would, uh, that gravitational waves would be observable, but I think he wouldn't mind that he was wrong. Good job. Black holes will be used and gravitational waves will be messengers to learn about the dark side of the universe. And for that, we will be building really big telescopes like LISA, an observatory in space, consisting of three satellites with million kilometer laser arms. And currently, we're flying a precursor. LISA Pathfinder launched exactly 100 years after Einstein published general relativity. It was a night launch in Kourou, French Guyana at 1 a.m. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top, and de of VV06. You want to hear both those words, allumage and décollage. The second one is important. It is currently in operation at the Lagrange point one, one and a half million kilometers away from us towards the sun. The first laser interferometry in space ever, and the first free-flying test mass interferometry. And there they are, two gold cubes flying freely in a heliocentric orbit, and we are measuring the distance between them with utmost precision. We measure better than the weight of a virus. Sitting down on one of these free-flying proof masses would make a big signal for us. And with these things, we will be able to listen to the universe and discover many other things. There are also black holes that are rotating. They are called black holes with spin. And when they coalesce, it will sound very, very different. I'll give you an example. And here you can clearly hear. Also nice. Huh? <laughs> so you could hear how the two spins that were initially not aligned were being turned around. You could hear the circularization of the elliptical orbit going into a spherical uh, circular orbit. And then finally, when they were touching, they whoop. And you wouldn't believe how many times this noise has been made with human mouths in our institute afterwards. <laughs> Make the black hole for me. Whoop. 
Oh, make it heavier. Whoop. <laughs> we will also be able to hear different things. You know where dead stars are going? To the graveyard. Cosmic graveyards contain white dwarfs. And this is, at midnight, a cosmic graveyard with white dwarfs, 3,000 of them. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? We can be looking forward to hearing all of those things. And I can tell you one thing, before I die, I will hear the Big Bang. And you all with me. Thank you.